So let us get started. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Hillary Goldstein. I'm the Public Programs Coordinator here at the New York Transit Museum. This virtual presentation is part of a series of online experiences that we're hosting throughout the year. Our virtual public programs include conversations, presentations, workshops, and performances hosted by the Transit Museum and often drawing from our internal archives, collections, and exhibitions. And we also have the pleasure of bringing in outside organizations and artists and scholars and writers to share their work and perspectives on transit. So we're really honored tonight to have Alison Meyer here to share her in-depth knowledge of transit and cemeteries. Uh, before we get to the main program, though, I'd love to just give you a little bit of background about the New York Transit Museum. The museum really started as an exhibition in the 1976 Bicentennial, and it was so popular it became a permanent museum in the 1980s. We're located in a decommissioned IND subway station in downtown Brooklyn, and we also have a gallery and shop in Grand Central Terminal. Our programs have gone largely virtual during the pandemic, but even though the museum is now open, we are continuing to host these online programs on a variety of topics and for a variety of ages. These virtual programs allow us to engage with museum and transit fans from all around the world. So before we get started, I'd love to note that if you would like closed captions, you can click where it says live transcript at the bottom of your screen and select show subtitle. If you don't see that option, click the more button with the little three dots and you'll see some more meeting setting options. We are gonna ask that everyone keep their microphones muted, but please feel free to use the chat to ask questions and comment and we will have time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. All right, so now I'm very pleased to introduce our guest presenter this evening, Allison Meyer. Allison is a writer on art, culture, and history with bylines that include the New York Times, Curbed, City Lab, and National Geographic. Her upcoming book, Grave, will be published by Bloomsbury in 2023 as part of their object lesson series. She also moonlights as a cemetery tour guide. So thank you so much for joining us today, Allison. Please take it away. Yeah, thanks so much, Hillary, and welcome everyone tuning in near and far. I also enjoy you know, continuing to do these online events. I'm, you know, it's always nice to kind of do something you don't have to leave your home for too, for me. Um, so welcome everybody. Yeah, and today I'm excited to share with you sort of the history of how do you get to the cemetery, this express train to the afterworld. So as Hillary mentioned in her nice um, introduction, I'm a writer, but I'm also um, a cemetery tour guide, and I really enjoy finding the surprising connections between cemeteries and transit and how getting to the cemetery has changed over time, particularly in New York City as it expanded. So I'm going to have a focus on New York City, but um, I am going to look at stuff all over the world at how transit kind of informed cemeteries and cemeteries in turn shaped transit. So in the early days of colonial New York, the movement of the dead was really the task of your neighbors and friends. They would carry the body on planks to the graveyard. If um, you were lucky, maybe there was an open wagon to help you for this purpose, but really nothing formal. Eventually though, there were dedicated hearses, which were still often a little more than wagons with maybe some straw to give the, the um, coffin some cushionings that rode over the unpaved streets. But hearses did become more elaborate. They had fringed curtains and wool draperies. They were usually painted black. And not only that, they'd be pulled by black horses. Usually the person um, driving the carriage would also be wearing all black. And these evolved into the auto hearses you know, that we still have today. But in cities, it was a lot more compu complicated, um, a progression of this posthumous travel for the dead, especially when growing populations really pushed the cemeteries to the outskirts. So most people used to be buried in churchyards or other burial grounds that were really like right alongside daily life. If you live in New York and you've been by Wall Street and Trinity Churchyard, you know how close that burial ground is right to the place people would be walking by, you know, every day. So visiting the cemetery was really not that hard. It was something you could do on your lunch break, something you could do on a Sunday afternoon walking from your home. But by the 19th century, all these graveyards in the urban center really became really overcrowded. And not only that were health concerns, there was this idea that bad air, like bad smells could get you sick, these miasmas. So cemeteries started to be relocated entirely or established outside the main city center. 
which in New York City was Brooklyn, Queens, the Bronx, and Staten Island, where there was just much more open land. And this is what's known as the rural cemetery movement. And the new graveyards that were established around this time were really more like gardens than burial grounds, emphasizing a new green landscape. So they became really popular, not just for mourners going to inter the dead, but people just wanting to get some fresh air, maybe walk around, take a picnic. It was not uncommon to have a picnic in the cemetery. And this was before you know, Central Park or Prospect Park existed. So it was one of the city's main um, green escapes you could get to on a day trip. The location of these cemeteries though made getting there more complicated. And so transfer, transportation was expanded to meet this need. Some cemeteries though were left behind by this kind of mass exodus of the dead and others were hidden beneath the development. But here you can see um, an illustration of First Sherith Israel Cemetery that dates back to the 17th century. It's one of the oldest Jewish burial grounds in North America. And here you can see it's kind of almost shrouded by that elevated track that we no longer have. And people are hanging laundry over the graves, which I don't think people do anymore. Eventually that elevated track was torn down, but I love that the 17th century cemetery has outlasted everything that continues to change around it. Another uh, consumed by this Manhattan sprawl was further uptown. And I want to give credit to the New York City Cemetery Project, which is a really excellent site run by Mary French for introducing me to the graveyard station. And so at left, there's this New York Times article from 1879 that describes it. And it goes, quote, on the line of the New York Elevated Railroad is a station commonly known as the Graveyard Station. It is at the junction of 9th Avenue and 50th Street and receives its name from a little graveyard about 50 square feet that occupies the southwest corner of intersecting streets. It is not much noticed by those on the sidewalk who see nothing but heavy stone walls surrounding it, but from the platform of the station, its handful of gray, crumbling tombstones can be plainly seen and its forlorn and neglected condition noted. Dirty children tumble and play over the graves and among the tottering stones and above all, lines of newly washed garments are blown about in the wind. I don't know why graveyards had so much laundry happening to them, probably just because they had the space. And they go on, as the passenger on the railroad while waiting for his train attempts to decipher the almost obliterated inscriptions on the monuments beneath him and questions the employees of the road who prove to know as little as himself. He wonders that a place so neglected should be retained for its present uses instead of having been built upon long since as has every other available plot of ground in the vicinity. So what this burial ground was, was part of um, an old farm owned by the Hopper family, which covered much of the area around it. And the graveyard was actually used until 1840. Then a descendant of the family removed the headstones, don't know about the bodies, but no poltergeist promises. And an apartment building was built there, in fact, um, in 1885. So most graveyard stations though, um, were purposefully set up at the new cemeteries outside of Manhattan. And I love this guide, The Cemeteries of New York and How to Reach Them, which was published in 1881 by Selden C. Judson. It lists many of the city's cemeteries and how to get there. And many of them involve multiple modes of transportation. For instance, for Cypress Hills in Brooklyn, Selden advised taking the Fulton Ferry, getting a streetcar from Atlantic, and then getting a steam car to the south entrance. And I also have an image here of a map of how to get to Maple Grove Cemetery in Queens, and it no has notes on conveying the remains from the train cars to the grave, which was a service that the cemeteries provided at that time. So for Calvary Cemetery in Queens, this guide states that you had to take a ferry from Manhattan and then a streetcar. There was a branch of the Grand Street Horse Car Line that had um, since 1860 run, 1861, run up to Penny Bridge, which I have an image of here at the left where you can see Calvary Cemetery in the background and also appropriately a train whizzing by. And it was named Penny Bridge because it would cost you a one cent toll to cross and to reach Calvary Cemetery. On the right, I have um, an example of one of those summer streetcars where all the 
the sides are open so you get a nice breeze on your way to the cemetery. And you can see Calvary Cemetery up there on, as one of its destinations or its final stop. So I've been to Calvary a number of times. I've usually taken a really long walk for the subway or tried to wait for a bus and sometimes given up. And you know, reading this, I realized it's actually, despite the fact it took so many steps, it was a little bit easier for you to do a door to cemetery complete transit. And so the city's um, infrastructure for the dead and transit are evolving alongside each other, but sometimes these remainders of it, we can no longer see. New York's first major rural cemetery was Greenwood in Brooklyn, which was established in 1838. I think I saw a number of people in the chat as Greenwood fans. I love Greenwood. So when it opened, there wasn't a Brooklyn bridge and the planners wanted it to be this very, you know, prestigious burial ground. But if they wanted that, they had to make it possible for the well-heeled living to easily get there as well. So this man named Henry Evelyn Pierpont who was a real big figure in making Brooklyn into a major city, was a proponent of establishing the cemetery on a hill overlooking the New York Harbor. And he just happened to also be a ferry mogul and decided to combine several existing ferries into the Brooklyn Union Ferry Company. So there'd be regular service between Manhattan and Brooklyn, making it easier not just to get to Brooklyn, but also to Greenwood Cemetery, which he had helped found. And he is in fact buried there on one of the most beautiful plots. If you've been there, you might've seen it. It's kind of like Gothic um, open tomb on a hill. It's really gorgeous. So by 1846, the cemetery is much more accessible by this ferry that ran to Hamilton Avenue in Red Hook. I have an image of the ferry house here. And from there, people could board a stagecoach to the cemetery entrance. Uh, bodies also traveled on this ferry along with funeral cortege's, but so did people just wanting to go enjoy the landscape. You know, again, no, no big city parks yet. So this idea of a landscape designed for people just to experience and be uplifted was really novel. Uh, Walt Whitman even wrote about how the ferries were, quote, necessary for the accommodation of a rapidly increase, increasing mass of citizens who are attracted to the salubrity of that section of Brooklyn, joined the cheapness of the land and the nearness of the beautiful grounds of the cemetery. Eventually, though, we do get the Brooklyn Bridge completed in 1883, and the subway lines would expand into Brooklyn. And so this ferry, once the most essential way to get from Brooklyn into Manhattan, fell out of favor. And this ferry um, terminal here was abandoned and finally torn down in 1956. For much of the 19th and 20th century, streetcars were the main way to get to most of New York City's cemeteries. And the busiest day was a Sunday in summer when people would go, uh, again, for picnics or just to walk around or visit their family grave. There were horse cars starting in the mid 19th century, and there was a major expansion of private trolley lines to places people wanted to go, which included the cemetery. So there was um, that Hamilton Avenue horse and cable car, which took visitors to 25th Street at um, Greenwood Cemetery. But there was also a Calvary Cemetery line, a Holy Cross Cemetery line, Cypress Hills Cemetery line, Lutheran Cemetery line. I have an image here from the New York Transit Museum's own archives of the Holy Cross Cemetery line, which ran along Empire Boulevard from Nostrand Avenue and then southeast to the cemetery. It actually was later replaced by a bus route, but after demand for even that waned, it was also discontinued. There's also a streetcar with tracks that ran by the Prospect Park West entrance of Greenwood Cemetery. So people had a lot of options to access this. These are some really cool photos that the Greenwood Cemetery archives shared for this talk. Um, one was even a photograph they took of, of a photo on their wall. So I'm not sure how widely circulated it is. I love these photos because that entrance looks almost exactly the same, but of course everything else has changed around it. Other examples of these streetcar lines are here. So top left, we see a streetcar passing Lutheran Cemetery in Middle Village, Queens. At right is Cypress Hills Cemetery and its electrified trolley, as well as the Cypress Hills train station. That station was the um, last stop for a line that is now part of the JMZ for many years until 1918. And at the bottom left is a ticket from 1912 for Calvary Cemetery on the New York 
and Queens County Railroad, so, well, Railway, excuse me, always bad to misspeak the things that are on the screen. So this was not um, unique to New York. Many other American cities had streetcars that went to cemeteries and sometimes were specifically used for funerals. So like New York, these cities had often passed ordinances that had pushed burials out of the urban center to the outskirts. And so they needed new transit to get people there. While there were not more and more auto hearses in the early 20th century, it's often a long way for these early cars to drive and you know, the roads were bumpy. You'd have to figure out a way to get your entire funeral party there. So streetcars could be more affordable than getting a hearse and additional transportation and just a more comfortable way to go. These funeral streetcars were usually decorated like hearses with drapery and gold leaf lettering, giving them this kind of ominous casket-like appearance that I don't think was on purpose. So the motorman and conductor would also be dressed all in black, you know, just like those old hearse drivers were with the carriages. Detroit started theirs in the 1890s. They had an electric funeral streetcar, which featured upholstered interiors for both the dead and the mourners to go to Woodmere Cemetery. Uh, St. Louis had funeral streetcars, which were chocolate brown with black velvet curtains inside. Baltimore had a funeral trolley nicknamed Dolores for Sorrow with a heavy plate glass door for the casket so the piles of flowers could be seen for the streets. Cleveland had its own streetcar introduced, funeral streetcar introduced in the 1890s. I found this article in a 1900 issue of the street railway journal, which explained that in Cleveland, the funeral car had the right of way. So it could start from the church and the cemetery waiting on no switch, just plow right through, which I don't know how fast these things were going, but it seems like it would be kind of an, an ominous thing to witness. Chicago also had a funeral street, uh, two funeral street cars with one elevated funeral car serving the city between 1905 and 1932. Two of the elevated stops had elevators to lift caskets to the platform. And this funeral car looked really similar to an ordinary L train car, but it had a special door for the casket. And again, some nice green carpeting inside. These cars also would go to spurs to the Chicago cemeteries like Rose Hill on the north side and Calvary and Evanston. Um, San Francisco too had funeral streetcars. They were custom made so they would be quieter than the other streetcars. Theirs were especially important because San Francisco really left no cemetery behind in their exodus of the dead. They moved a lot of people to Colma. And so to get there, there was also a train that could take uh, a streetcar that could take you there. And then um, the Philadelphia Rapid Transit Company also had a funeral trolley called the Hillsdale that operated from 1912 to 1932 when it was scrapped. It's unfortunately what happened to most of these. Uh, it had room for 40 mourners and six pallbearers and the casket would be held in the space below a large window. You can see it on the upper right here um, where that casket would go. And although it was built for Hillsdale, Hillsdale Cemetery, and that's where it got its name, it was used for different cemeteries throughout the city. So as I said, um, unfortunately, most of these funeral cars, when they became obsolete about in the 1920s with the expansion of roads and private cars for mourners, they were just scrapped. However, one does still survive that you can go visit out in California. The Los Angeles Railway had the Descanso, which is Spanish for rest one of its two funeral streetcars. The other was the Paraiso or Paradise. They went into operation in 1909 and could be chartered for funerals at $25. The Descanso was painted gray, it had decorative scroll work and inside it had these nice wicker armchairs for the mourners to sit on as well as stained glass windows. So it was retired you know, around when all of these were, but um, it had an interesting afterlife where it got moved to the summit station between San Bernardino and the San Gabriel Mountains and turned to a cabin with bunks and a kitchen. So that station too closed eventually, got abandoned. But after years of neglect, these railroad enthusiasts recognized how important it was. In the 1980s, it was finally moved to the Southern California Railway Museum in Paris, where it remains today. So although we have all these examples, uh, funeral streetcars were never as popular in the US 
as they were in Mexico and South America, where they became attractions, you know, even listing guidebooks. Especially in Mexico City, the majority of the dead were transported on these streetcars from the late 19th into the early 20th century with horse-driven streetcars first, moving on to electric, and again, drivers dressed all in black, wearing silk hats. They were seen as a progressive solution to inequities in death, as um, unlike a lot of American systems, they carried the bodies of people regardless of class and free of charge. However, there was uh, reports of bad upkeep on the tramways leading to derailments and stories of corpses being thrown into the street. I have an illustration here showing one of those unfortunate incidents. The uh, Mexican Civil War would lead to the destruction of many of these trolley lines. So, you know, they eventually went out of service as well. And then Paris had its tramway funeraire that went between a church and the new cemetery in Vincennes, which is another suburban cemetery. This one had several compartments for the family and clergy and of course the corpse. You can see in that right hand photo similar to the American streetcars how a casket compartment would open up. And apparently this was enough of interest to make a postcard of it, which you can see at the left. So back in New York City, um, a couple of the more unusual cemetery lines were for Lutheran and Cypress Hill Cemetery. They were serviced by two of the city's few steam railroads, which were set up through the Bushwick Railroad. The Cypress Hills line opened in 1878 and was so successful that the Lutheran line opened in 1881. They had what were known as these steam dummy engines because they were disguised to look like um, railway railroad passenger coaches. I read this was supposedly to not scare the horses, but I don't think horses are quite that stupid. Uh, it, they went uh, about 10 miles per hour, so not super fast, but it was pretty fast for transportation at the time. But um, electrification, and of course, the expansion of the subway elevated system would soon make them obsolete as well, although the M line does still follow some of the Lutheran line's original path. So those elevated lines that replaced some of these systems were also eventually torn down. In Greenwood, the Fifth Avenue line allowed you to get off right at the cemetery, but also towered above its entrance for years after it opened in 1889. And on finally, on September 15th, 1941, there was the demolition of the Fifth Avenue elevated, which started at 35th Street and Fifth Avenue. And it was completed by November of that year, which is Seems astoundingly fast for such a thing to happen, but you can still walk under the 36th Street, 36th Street Tunnel in the cemetery that I have a photo of mine on the bottom right, which I thought was very cool because I had walked through that tunnel so many times and not really considered why it was there. And to see that photo at the top right really just changed my thoughts about what it must have been like to be in that cemetery, you know, 100 years ago. So Greenwood also has a grimmer reminder of transit past. I wanted to put in some tombstones with train themes too, just to remind you there is more than just the cemetery railroad there. There's also the cemetery itself. This is a memorial to Oscar and Maggie Dietzel. They were killed in an LIRR train collision. This is actually what's known as the Cenotaph. So it's memorializing them, but they are buried elsewhere. They're actually at Lutheran cemetery in Queens. Um, they were on a train back from Manhattan Beach on August 26, 1893, when another train from Rockaway Beach was allowed on the same track by mistake. It hit the last train of the car, killing 16 people, seriously injuring 40. And you can see the collision carved here at marble. I, you know, I can't imagine what this thing looked like when it was completed. It must have been so detailed, but when you walk up to it, you still can immediately see what it is depicting. New York City's uh, cemetery, the closest relationship to trains, though, is Woodlawn, which I think some people also mentioned in the chat earlier. So it opens in 1863, so a little bit after Greenwood, and train access was part of its planning from the beginning. There's a September 1865 New York Times article which notes that, quote, arrangements have been made with the Harlem Railroad Company for transporting special funeral trains to the northeast entrance at Woodlawn Station. So funeral cars or whole funeral train could be arranged for a departure from Grand Central Depot. I have a map of that route here from that old Selden's uh, How to Get to the Cemetery Guide. 
funeral cars or whole um, funeral trains, you know, could travel this and they would be met at the tracks with a, um, or they were, they had like a uh, hearses and, and carriage that would meet them at the tracks just to get the, the casket from these trains. So be because of its early access, um, Woodlawn became quickly popular with wealthy New Yorkers. Even though Greenwood is still there, like the fact you could get on this train, go up to Woodlawn um, was so convenient. In fact, it's something they really advertised for getting people to be buried there. This is the large granite mausoleum of railroad tycoon Collis Huntington, who died in 1900. He was pivotal in developing the transcontinental railroad system. The tomb itself is designed by John C. Babcock and was built by Robert Catterson, who was involved in work on Grand Central Station. It took about five years to build this whole thing. And I was reading according to Historic Districts Council that that large double flight staircase was inspired by one in New York's Penn Station. I had a tough time sort of matching it up to a specific staircase, but I think perhaps what they mean is that sort of tiered appearance at the beginning looking very similar to one that was in the station that of course has also been torn down. Um, here's some more images of the Woodlawn Station and a ticket that they had in an exhibit at Columbia University a few years ago. So the Evening Post on March 29th, 1876 noted about Woodlawn, quote, the seeming necessity that compelled the establishment of our older cemeteries at points remote from the thickly peopled districts of the metropolis has certainly entailed upon families some extra expense and inconvenience. While the newer cemetery is sufficiently secluded, it is reached in 30 minutes by rail from the Grand Central Depot, and the Harlem Railroad Company has made a station for express trains at its very gates. So the growth of the railroad would also support more cemetery expansion out of the city, such as two more I'm going to show you now. One was Kensico Cemetery, which was established in 1889, another option for New York City, but was feeling, you know, pressed for space in its cemeteries. They also had a station, the Kensico Cemetery Station, which opened in 1891 to serve the cemetery. And again, also a private railroad car, meet your funeral party at Grand Central, take you to Kensico. And um, the interior had three compartments again, one for the casket, one for the family, one for your friends and relatives, designed to be this comfortable private journey. They even advertised that, quote, you would be without the slightest contact with the traveling public, which is, you know, something that sounds very nice. Uh, and they also, you can see in this ad from the bottom right, advertise their 43 minute ride from Grand Central. So not quite at the, you know, 30 for Woodlawn, but certainly not far away. After the line was electrified though, the station closed and um, now you can get there from the appropriately named Valhalla stop. It's still very close to the cemetery. Also bus supported by this expansion of the Harlem Railroad was Hartsteel Pet Cemetery, which was established in 1896 as the Hartsteel Canine Cemetery. Pets, like humans, would travel in their caskets, although unfortunately not with such privacy. They'd have to go on ordinary trains from Grand Central to Hartsteel. And they have a new station of Hartsteel there at the left. I have a photo of that's open in 1914. Gorgeous station designed by Warren and Wetmore. It's actually still there. Um, there's Starbucks inside now. And I have um, this report from Scientific American in 1901 that describes the scene when you pull up to the station. So they write, the train stops for a moment to let off a few passengers a heart's tail and hurries on. One party evidently in deep trouble and carrying a somewhat heavy box into a waiting automobile and are whisked away up the hill. If we follow them, we soon reach a five acre cemetery on a delightful slope of one of those Westchester Hills just north of New York City. Entering the gates, we find a cemetery not looking very different from where human beings are interned, except that the plots seem a little smaller and the tombstones of modest dimensions. So back down the railroad again, returning to Woodlawn. Um, when that expansion was taking place, you know, this part of the Bronx was pretty rural, but all of this supports more residential development. And this really took off when the subway was extended into the Bronx with the IRT Jerome Avenue line, with Woodlawn's Board of Trustees even advocating for the cemetery to be the last stop. And in fact, is still the last stop on the four train at the station pictured here. So it was designed by um, the subway's chief ar architect, Squire, Squire Vickers, 
It had ornamental concrete that straddles the street. So there was some attention to making this a little bit interesting, although certainly nothing like some of those older stations. Now, stepping out of New York City, other cemeteries are expanding their train systems also. They had stations specifically for cemeteries. I think someone might have their microphone on, um, or I'm starting to be haunted at this point in the presentation. Um, a funeral train in Chicago would leave daily for Rose Hill and then Calvary Cemetery with different types of fares, one for the mourners, another corpse ticket for the deceased, which cost about double the regular fare. So no um, equity in burial like you had in Mexico City. They even had a baggage car that could contain multiple caskets on a single train. Um, people would be dropped off with just enough time to bury their loved ones, pay their respects by the time the train was returning to take them back to downtown Chicago. And so it operated from the mid 19th century. And after the tracks were raised through grade elevation in the early 1900s, this elevator was added to the Rose Hill station. It was designed to match the cemetery building alongside complete with stained glass windows. And so what this was for was when the train came, you didn't have to lug the casket down some stairs, although I think you could do that if you wanted to, but this was a much more dignified way. You could go into the corpse elevator, but gently lower you down to the ground, and then you could continue on to the cemetery. And if that's, the, I didn't make that clear, that building is still there, but the elevator sadly no longer in service. So you have to go to walk. Um, in Sydney, Australia, they had a gorgeous railway station for their suburban Rookwood Cemetery line that operated from 1867 to 1948. It was also called the Mortuary Receiving Railway Station and was built from sandstone with a ticket office, sculpted foliage, tessellated floors. And you can kind of see in the photo on the top right, there were these um, angels on either side, one an angel of death and one of resurrection holding a trumpet. And the bell um, at the station would signal whenever the train was about to depart. The mourners could be sure not to miss it. This is a huge cemetery. It's so big, it has its own postcode. So this actually wasn't even its only station. It had four stations, but this one was definitely the grandest. The building after it closed was actually taken apart and in the 1950s moved to Ainsley and in Australia and became this church, which you can see at the bottom right, which still stands today, which is pretty cool. In London, they had the London Necropolis Railway Company, or the London Necropolis Company, which had one of the most fantastic logos ever created on the, on the right there. And this was for getting people to Brookwood Cemetery, which was established 23 miles southwest of London. Um, at 500 acres, it was then the largest cemetery in the world. But because it was so far away, you know, they really had to get people there, especially because the planners had very grand visions of this being the place every dead Londoner would be buried for eternity or however long they expected it to last. They had a dedicated terminus at Waterloo Station and then also two stations in the cemetery, one for the Anglicans and one for the nonconformists, which basically means anyone who wasn't part of the Church of England. And similarly, you know, separate compartments for the living of, and the dead, but they uniquely also had separate spaces for these religious divisions. And the railway was also actually moved to relocate long dead people from those overflowing graveyards into the new cemetery to make way for more development. Um, unfortunately for them, you know, this cemetery really never quite dominated burial like they had planned. In the 1900s, when cremation became more popular, it hurt their numbers any, even more. So their planners had hoped they'd bury 50,000 people a year, ended up closer to 3,200. And there are reports that golfers would actually pretend to be going to the cemetery dressed up as mourners to get the really cheap Necropolis Railway fare, but then they would just get off at the golf course. And so they weren't making a lot of money on this. And then um, things got like a little bit, uh, I, let me try to flip it. I heard these slides might be glitchy. We'll see. And then things um, got a little bit worse for them. They got hit by a blitz air raid, destroying um, a lot of their services in, the, in London. And then, so the only thing that really survives today in London is this 1902 building on Westminster Bridge Road, which was once the entrance to their private railway station. All right, let's hope Hillary's gonna let me know if the slide looks okay. Okay, great. So um, sorry about that. Things were getting a little spooky there. I can only see my own screen. 
So after the war ended, that London station closed. It was sold. Tracks were removed. However, the South Station Chapel still survives, and Brookwood Cemetery is actually a Russian Orthodox monastery now that includes a small museum. These are all my photos. I went there in 2017. I was very excited about this. They have like parts of the old track. Um, you can see how the interior looks. This was a chapel for the railroad station, but is still being used as a chapel um, that you can see there. It's still really beautiful. So there's also been um, dedicated funeral trains for like heads of state, such as monarchs in the UK have often had funeral trains. Actually, Elizabeth, um, who died recently, was really breaking with tradition when her body, or she wasn't, the people, she's not doing anything now, but she was flown by an airplane, making her the first British monarch in about two centuries to not have a funeral train. In the United States, we've had several famous funeral trains for our presidents, particularly if their deaths demanded a public form of mass mourning, and if the president died far from home and where they wanted to be buried. So this mirrored, you know, how presidents traveled in their lifetimes. There wasn't an Air Force One or anything until the, you know, 20th century. The first was for Abraham Lincoln. Um, his funeral train departed Washington, D.C. on April 21st, 1865 for his hometown of Springfield, Illinois, a sort of reversal of the route he had taken to become president. His casket was carried in the presidential railroad car, which had been designed for him to travel in, but he never got the chance to use it while he was alive. Alongside him was the coffin of his young son, Willie, who had died three years earlier. They had removed him from a vault at Georgetown to be reinterred with his father. So this trains traveled through seven states and 180 cities. On 10 of its stops, his casket was removed from the car and processed through the streets to Lyon State, where the upper part of the lid of his coffin was open for viewing. So this was only possible because of the new innovations in embalming that could preserve his body for several weeks. There was a sort of competition of civic pride everywhere he went where they would have increasingly elaborate hearses, um, big you know, funeral bouquets, just to kind of outdo each other on how they were mourning the president. Some people though only travel to the um, tracks themselves and watch the train go by. So there are all these thousands of people you know, taking off their hats, bowing their heads in mourning all along the railroad. And he was finally buried on May 4th, 1865 in Oak Ridge Cemetery in Illinois, three weeks after his assassination. It's estimated that millions were part of this mass funeral that offered a real catharsis, not just for the country in mourning, but for all the people who had lost someone in the Civil War. There's also been um, funeral trains that followed, including James A. Garfield, who was assassinated at the Baltimore and Potomac Railroad Station in Washington, D.C. in 1881, um, just six and a half months into his presidency. His body traveled from Elberton, New Jersey to Washington, D.C., and eventually to Cleveland, Ohio for burial, and bells were tolled as it went through the towns, and thousands, pe thousands of people assembled to watch it pass. Then um, Ulysses S. Grant, when he died in 1885 from cancer at his home on Mount McGregor in Saratoga County, New York, a funeral train took him to Lyon State in Albany before his interment in Manhattan's Riverside Park. And then at the bottom left here, we have um, President William McKinley after his 1901 assassination at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, New York, just six months into his second inauguration, he was transported by a funeral train from Washington, D.C. to Ohio, likewise witnessed by thousands. And at the bottom right is President Warren Hardy's funeral train. From 1923, he had a heart attack while in San Francisco and then posthumously traveled around 3,000 miles from California to Washington and was finally buried in Marion, Ohio. Uh, some people would put coins on the tracks and have them as souvenirs after the train ran them over. And then just a few more here. Uh, when FDR died in 1985 at his retreat in Warm Springs, Georgia, his body was taken to Washington, D.C. by train to Lyon State before traveling by train to his final resting place in Hyde Park, New York. There were honor guards, a serviceman stationed along the route, which was thronged with mourners because um, his death really came as a shock to the public who was unaware of his declining health. A famous politician who was not president but was honored with a funeral train was Senator Robert F. Kennedy. After his 1968 assassination, his body was transported from New York City to Washington, D.C. by train with about a million people lining the tracks. 
the um, train conductor said that like there were so many pennies on the tracks that they could actually feel them being crushed as they went along. And I, uh, Paul Fusco, a photographer, did a really excellent series of photos from the train capturing the people mourning that you can see one of those on the bottom left. That in 1969, Dwight D. Eisenhower had a funeral train from Washington, D.C. to his hometown of Abilene, Kansas. He rode in the old Santa Fe private rail car he had traveled in during his presidential campaign. They actually really wanted this to be private because two people had died um, during the Kennedy funeral train in, a, in an accident just due to overcrowding, but people found out the route and just turned out for it anyway. And then our last uh, presidential funeral train is for George H.W. Bush from 2018 that traveled 70 miles from Spring, Texas to College Station, Texas for his burial. And you can see that they had a train car, the glass viewing area, so you can see the casket as it went by. So though um, through the 20th century, you know, funeral travel moved more and more into private automobiles, although there were some attempts at mass transit. Oh no, I'm glitching again. <laughs> is it okay? <laughs> Right, we're, we just got a few minutes left. I got to we'll, we'll hope it sticks with us. Um, there's, you know, and there were a couple of solutions to try to get, to get this idea of like getting everyone to the um, cemetery together, like and cheaply. I have on the left here the Packard funeral bus, which was a huge thing that could uh, carry the coffin and 20 mourners. But unfortunately, um, it was very unstable. And it said that he tipped over on a hill in San Francisco. I don't know why they were driving it there, spilling people into the street or so the story goes. And on the right here is when Airstream decided to branch out in the 1980s. Um, it was the time of the uh, gas crisis. So they were kind of looking for things people might need and things they could sell. And so they introduced this funeral coach, which could carry your whole funeral party and the casket neatly in there, along with 20 bouquets of flowers. Um, mostly, though, I feel like my slides might be glitching again. All right. The cars ended up as the way to get to the cemetery. I think I saw someone here um, say, like, they couldn't get into Greenwood back in the day because, like, the cars were only allowed. It really became, like, cars were the way to get to the cemetery and um, these kind of systems of transportation faded although some of the uh, subway lines here in New York you know their last stop is still the cemetery kind of attesting to this history. And I'm going to end here with um, a little railroad epitaph. So there are a number of tombstones for railway workers all around the world that have variations of a similar epitaph. This is the engine driver's epitaph and I'm going to offer it not just to these fallen engine drivers, but to the cemetery transit. So it goes, my engine now is cold and still, no water does my boiler fill. My coal affords its flame no more. My days of usefulness are o'er. My wheels deny their running speed. No more my guiding hand they need. My whistle too has lost its tone. Its shrill and thrilling sounds are gone. My valves are now thrown open wide. My flanges all refer, refuse to guide. My clacks also, though once so strong, refuse to aid the busy throng. No more I feel each surging breath. My steam is now condensed in death. Life's railway over each station passed. In death, I'm stopped and rest at last. And we'll see if I can get the last slide to come up without glitching. Doesn't look like it. Did I do it, Hillary? <laughs> Okay, I did it. So that was a quick, you know, tour through a lot of cemetery transit. I'm sure you have questions. I wanted to be sure to leave time. But I just wanted to end that. Um, well, I would love to do nothing more than talk about funeral streetcars. My um, main job is as a writer about various things. As I mentioned, I have a book coming out in February, but I also make zines about cemetery things. I just did this one on the cemetery language of flowers. And I write a lot about art and history that you can find at those uh, sites I've listed there. I'm an easy person to find, so feel free to look out for information. And I'll open it up to the Transit Museum people again. Yeah. Okay, thanks so much, Alsa. That was just so fascinating, so much detail and so much amazing history. Um, we would love to open it up to you all who have come to join us. If you have any questions, please, um, type them into the chat and um, we'll use this last few minutes to kind of uh, to go over them. Um, I had a question that came up a little bit earlier. Um, did funeral cars run on a regular schedule? 
Yeah, that's a good question. I believe it de really depended on where you were. A lot of them would be like you kind of hired them. Um, I believe that was the case with Kenzigo Cemetery. They had their own car that could be attached to, you know, a different train. But others, I think for like the London Necropolis Railway that there worked in schedule but they were also anticipating you know we're gonna have so much traffic everyone's gonna be going here so i think that they were um ambitious but often it would be especially for those um funeral streetcars you would hire them for your funeral um i think i mentioned one of them costs like 25 dollars which i should have looked up how much that is in uh 2022 money but you know it wasn't cheap to rent the funeral streetcar but if you think about now to get your whole funeral party, you got to get the hearse. You have to get limousines if you don't ever want everyone driving in their random sedans. You got to like find a way to get the flowers there. So it kind of made a lot of sense. But then also I think, yeah, it, like asking about the time is is interesting because like there's all these times you aren't having funerals. You got to put these cars somewhere. Right, and that, you, that kind of dovetail with another question was how much did it cost to really rent a train for a funeral? Yeah, it again, it kind of depended on place. Like, I think it was in Chicago that the corpse ticket was double the ordinary fare, whereas in Mexico City, corpses rode free. <laughs> so the, um, that's sort of a American thing. You're like, well, they got to pay for the corpse probably, so we got to get them on that. But it it did really depend too from city to city. And then when there's like the um the lines we had here, like to Lutheran, to um other cemeteries, like in Queens and Brooklyn, those are running all the time, but you couldn't bring a coffin on them. So like you could easily go there for the same price of any other transit, but you just couldn't really easily fit your whole funeral on there. And I think somebody just asked about Hart Island, which if I had time, I should add another slide about Hart Island because they're um, a cemetery, I think the only one in New York City that's still only accessible by ferry. And I have been there, I've been there twice. Um, you used to be able to go there as a member of the public and go to the sort of gazebo-like structure. And I should explain for anyone not in New York City, Hart Island is New York's potter's field. It's basically where everyone who doesn't who cannot pay for a burial, who is unidentified, who is stillborn, um, is buried, and they're buried in these long trenches. It's a very harrowing place, but it's, you know, a place that has a, a lot of meaning to it for um, all the thousands that are buried there. But yeah, Hart Island still has a funeral ferry um, that I believe is still operating, although the this is a lot of information. <laughs> We're not doing a Hart Island talk, but recently the oversight of Hart Island transferred from Department of Correction to NYC Parks. And I think they are being worked out about how accessibility is going to work. Great. So we still have some time for a couple more questions if anyone has any to put in the chat. Um, I mean, I'm, I would be interested just to know kind of what, what drew you to this kind of research and, and this subject matter, because it's, it's definitely not on the the kind of it's a little off the mainstream I think yeah um oh and sure and I feel like I should put up your your transit museum slide now for all of your stuff just to, so we can plug everybody yeah uh, what interested me I think that um I you know I've had a lot of I I often write about design and architecture and planning and it always fascinates when planners and architects are so interested with the management of the dead and the care of the dead and that like drawing attention to um full linked cemeteries and um transit is is like a really interesting way to show that that you no know, how we decide to care for the dead does influence things and as somebody that probably thinks more about cemeteries than other people i'm always kind of just thinking about like how are you know places that we kind of see as like no pun and maybe like dead space in our cities like actively influencing the city and I've been sort of you know for the transit museum I definitely delved into this more than I have before but like those photos I took of the London Necropolis Railway Chapel from 2017 so I've been just kind of like it's just something that really interested me because it's something we all have to think about at some point and I think we take it for granted like 
when we go to a funeral now, we just get in a car and, and we're there. But like you think about how did people do this in the past? And um, I, again, I, there could be an hour and a half version of this slide, but I also um, am really interested in corpse roads, like in England that like linked towns and cemeteries. So I, I just find it all really interesting. I feel like it, before I ramble us to the end, I think a question. Um, yeah, there's a question here from from Kristen. Um, I know trolley companies build parks and baseball fields and such at the end of the line to increase weekend ridership. You mentioned summer Sundays were popular picnic cemetery days. Did trolley companies actually start or build any of the cemeteries themselves or were they just already there? Yeah, that's a good question. There was include here because I couldn't quite do enough research on it to get a good story about it. But there's um, one of the guys involved in the Erie Railroad, I believe, also established a cemetery. And I think he was really hoping, you know, being a railroad guy, that he would be doing exactly what you said, like cash all around. Um, yeah, I'm going to get the railroad there. I got my my for-profit cemetery, but I don't know that that quite worked out. But for the trolley companies, the only one that's close is like that, um, the Pierpont that I mentioned, him being involved in both the Hamilton Avenue ferry and then also establishing Greenwood. But yeah, it's, it seems like more people would have done it. But um, I think that like, it's a lot to run a cemetery, so you really got to, like, be thinking long-term. Um, long term. Uh, long transit line, you know, that el those elevated lines came and went. Cemetery is still there. Great. Um, another question here from Julie. Do you have a sense of why ossuary, ossuaries, ossuaries, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, never caught on in the U.S. where they were so popular in Europe? <laughs> Ossuary. <laughs> I feel like I say it different each time. Somebody in the chat, if we're right or wrong. Uh, it, I think that it's uh, Tanya Marsh, who has written extensively about cemetery law. Um, she told me that it's like, you know, America kind of created this idea that when you're put in the ground, you're there forever. You own that land. You don't really. It's you're You're kind of leasing it. But Americans think of it that way. And I think just because this country has had so much land that we really haven't had to reckon with that. So like the catacombs in Paris were set up when they were also dealing with their urbanary issue, like Cimetière de Innocent there was just overflowing for centuries. It was a mess. And those are the bones that got moved into the catacombs. And then they established Père Lachaise on the edge of the city. So I think like we have had those kind of reburials, but because um, you know there have been people buried here for centuries, but um, white Americans have never had issues in indigenous graves. So like those have not been treated with the same care as if there were like centuries of of uh, our like if Greenwood Cemetery ever needed to be moved at some point. I don't think people would just build. Or maybe there would be an ossuary. Um, yeah, and I, the only thing that's close is New Orleans does practice a sort of ossuary system with their graves where you're interred in one of those slots and after you're decomposed, you're put into the bottom like your bones are together with your family. So fascinating. Um, I, th I think I'm just going to ask one more question so we can kind of wrap up, but I was just interested in, you know, in all of your research and all of your experience with all these different spaces and places, do you have a favorite cemetery, a favorite monument um, that kind of sticks out for you? Yeah, that is a good question. I mean, Greenwood is beautiful, and I have a little bias because I lead tours there, but um, a really interesting one in, in uh, Oklahoma, Gower Cemetery, uh, it's the only surviving physical um, of 19th century Black uh, homesteaders, like people who are on the land run, established by them to be a place for their Black rural community. And it's just such a moving place to go to because it's like his hear about oh, the land run, like, you know, freed slaves going to settle land in Oklahoma. And I think to see all those graves there, like some made of concrete and and, um, you know, with the names on the people kind of like establishing themselves there and the fact that they also set aside land to have anybody that needed a place to be buried. Um, 
I yeah, Gower Cemetery in Oklahoma is probably one of my favorites. Not not the most beautiful, not the grand, but I think it's one of the most meaningful. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you all for coming and joining at this event. Allison Meyer, thank you for sharing your incredible research that's just so fascinating, such an interesting way to kind of think about funerals and transit and um, we are looking forward to hearing more from your book. Here I have in the chat um, is a link for oh, a thanks, presentation if you want to find out more. Um, just a quick reminder, just from the Transit Museum, that we are now open with um, expanded hours. So you can visit us from Thursdays through Sundays from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. We do require advanced tickets, but you can purchase those online at newyorktransitmuseum.org. If you enjoy our programming, please consider giving a donation. It helps us continue to do this work. And we hope to see you at our next virtual program. We are going to be having our next one next Saturday morning. Um, we are gonna be paying tribute to the 10 year anniversary of Hurricane Sandy. Um, so this is October 22nd, Saturday at 9.30 a.m. Our education coordinator, Marie Fazio, will lead a discussion of the impact of the superstorm on New York's transit system and also the efforts that the MTA has since taken to prepare our transit system for future climate events. So this event is part of Open House New York's annual weekend festival, and we hope to see you there. You can also check the website for upcoming programs. We're gonna be having our uh, tour of Old City Hall Station, which is gonna be a virtual program that's happening Thursday, October 27th at 6 p.m. And so we hope to see you there. Thank you so much for coming and we'll see you next time. Yeah, thanks so much, Hillary, and I hope everyone gets on a graveyard wander for this beautiful fall weather. Yes, perfect time to visit. Yes.